Okay, everyone, I think we'll make a start. Um, Stuart probably needs very little introduction for everybody, but um, just to say that um, freemoodle.org is um, a, a really great um, innovation in the spirit of openness and freedom um, that we've been talking about this morning. Uh, recently, I had someone who was at a workshop, uh, was a PhD student from uh, Vietnam, and she said to me at the end of the workshop, our university does not run any learning management system, but I would like to use it. Where can I go to try uh, to, to set up a course so that my students can try it out? And I said, well, freemoodle.org is a really great place to start. So without any further ado, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Stephen. Wow. Um, I think we've been running the Moodle Moots here in New Zealand for about six years now, and I've never, ever presented. Um, <laughs> It's kind of caught up with me, and a couple of people said, look, you've got to do some work this year. <laughs> um, and, of course, I would never want to put myself on a programme that, that, that we're running, uh, but this is a particularly sort of unique project, so, um, and we did actually mention it uh, at the last Moodle Moot, very briefly, about what we might be doing, so it kind of makes sense to do this. And I, I do talk about this all around the world, so that, that's... I should, be, I should be fairly good at this by now. Um, if you don't know who HRD and Z are and what we do, you can go and look at our services and our people and sort of client base and what we do. We tend to work more with uh, private educators, PTEs, uh, companies, charities, blah, 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 rather than schools, because Catalyst are obviously just so strong in that school space. There's no point in trying to compete, you know, let's work together rather than and do things like that. Um, and probably 75% of our work is overseas. In fact, our biggest single client is in the Middle East. Um, that's kind of nice to say that, you know, we've got this little company in New Zealand and we're doing all this work around the world. In a way, it's also a little bit sad because it means we don't have so much time for New Zealand projects, but uh, that's life, I guess. So, let me... Find my presentation. There we go. Um, how do you how do you do a slideshow on this one? Anyone? Just you slideshow. <laughs> slideshow. Let's go back. Okay. And then from beginning. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I don't use Windows. <laughs> I don't. No, seriously. About about five years ago, I sent an email to all my friends and neighbours and said, look guys, I'm giving up Windows completely. If you can ask me any questions, make sure it's in the next six months. Um, because I was using my computer one day, and I realized that uh, I, had, I had a virus checker, and a firewall, and a pop-up blocker, and I realized that when I was updating my computer, more than 50% of the things on it were actually for security and et cetera. More than half the software and apps on my computer were nothing to do with me being productive. And I thought, this, this cannot be right. So obviously we used Linux for servers, so I started using Linux, and I use Linux and Mac now all the time. Very, very rarely use Windows, unfortunately. Okay. So um, this presentation is, is going to look at, at why we started Free Moodle and how we set it up and, and how it's organised, um, some of the policies and things that we've encountered over the last sort of 18 months and um, working towards some of the challenges that we, that we see with this in the future direction. Um, if you have questions as I'm going, just feel free to shout them out. But we should have some time at the end for questions. And um, I always say, when I'm talking about free Moodle, uh, I, I absolutely want to hear your comments. I absolutely want to hear you say, well, I can see a problem with this being, or I can see an opportunity for this being. I want that feedback, that's why we're doing this. Um, so just quickly, um, we've been Moodle partners since 2006, you can read about what we do, we do all sorts of online training for teachers and designers and administrators and people who want to be able to write MySQL reports on their Moodle site. Um, we have a couple of free sites, we've got a dev Moodle site, moodlebytes.com. You know the plugins that you can get for Moodle? 
that site runs about 50 to 100, and you can actually go and try them out for free. You don't even need to register. You can just go and try those. Um, and we also do lots of themes and, and stuff like that. Miriam, who's here today, um, is our theme guru and CSS guru and knows far more than I do about that stuff these days. Um, we organise the New Zealand meetings, yeah. We actually have um, five PHMs. So who here actually has got like a login on Moodle.org? You know, actually active user. Okay, about half, that's all right. So on Moodle.org, people that, that go into forums and help others and, you know, contribute, they can be rated as helpful by other people. And when you get to like, whatever it is, 100 helpfuls and you're doing lots of posts and getting great feedback, you can become a particularly helpful Moodler. It's like a group that you go into. And there are, it varies, but there are between sort of 90 and 110 PHMs at any one time, because if you stop posting, you'll actually drop off the list. So we have uh, five in our company, which is more than any other organisation in the world, and I'm incredibly proud when I say that. Um, some, of these, some of these people you may know, uh, Miriam, uh, Teresa, uh, myself over there. Uh, over in Mexico, we have Mariel, who works for us, in, based in Mexico City. And she looks after all our Spanish work. Obviously, she's a native Spanish speaker. Um, so she looks after all that sort of stuff in Latin and South America. And she writes the most passionate emails about anything. <laughs> um, and we've got Anna Krasa, who's a, a PHM. She's, all, she's based in Greece. And... Uh, that was really nice last year. We went to the, the research conference in Crete and worked with Anna there for a while as well. So, um, yeah, you may notice these people on Moodle.org from time to time. Um, so one question that, that I kind of have to ask is, why would anyone provide free hosting for Moodle? You know, what's kind of in it for you would be the logic. I'm a, I'm a businessman. So I'm like, okay, something's for free, but, you know, What's behind that statement? Well, if you look around the forums on Moodle.org, you can see lots of discussions about free hosting. Lots of teachers or independent people who, who want to do something saying, can I, can I host courses for free? And there's lots of discussions. And um, it's interesting because they kind of fall into one of two categories. You quite often get someone saying, yeah, I know where you can host for free or even... I'll host your courses for free. You know, email me. You're like, wow, that's good. Um, and you find that they tend to fall into one of two brackets. Okay? It's either a kind of lost leader for the next stage. So yes, we'll give you hosting for free, but then you've got to sign up to our training course to keep that, or we're going to run lots of adverts on your site, or, you know, there has to be a payback there. Um, and the other group, and there are lots of these, the other group of, uh, of, of people that offer this are, are often just really enthusiastic individuals. So you might be working at a, at a university and you've got all this server capability sitting there and you know that you can just set up Moodle sites for people and they can use them for free. And that's nice. The, the, the problem with that is it doesn't scale. What happens if that person leaves that organisation? What happens when the, the bandwidth goes through the roof? You know, uh, it's not really a long-term solution. It might be fine as a first, you know, dabbling with Moodle, but it's not really going to take you further than that. So, um, yeah, um, we have a, a, a primary reason for doing this. This is my wife, Heidi, um, and uh, Heidi was totally, totally central in in getting me into Moodle. Um, she bought me my first book on Linux, because I was like a Microsoft boy up to that point, totally. It, I even ran and set up Microsoft training centres in the UK. That's kind of part of my background. And she'd heard me banging on about Linux, and she, she went to Dick Smith one day and says, there's a book on Linux, for God's sake, read about it, and stop telling me how great it is. <laughs> Um, so I did that and I built a server and it was like, yeah, okay. And, I, and one of the first things I thought was, oh, let's look at learning management systems on Linux and um, discovered Moodle and registered and, and pretty much went from there. So Heidi used to work with, uh, with us and um, was in fact the, the first PHM 
in our company. So she was the first person to get this recognition on Moodle.org of help being so helpful. And uh, that kind of inspired the rest of us to you know, like, really? You've got that? I wish you'd have that. <laughs> um, but it was a kind of very genuine thing from Heidi. Heidi had worked in the uh, Royal Navy in the UK for 14 years. Um, and she really had that kind of, of being of service to other people, you know, in a really genuine way. Uh, which I hadn't had until I met her, you know. I was very much dragging myself out of Liverpool and trying to be successful and probably stamping on a few people on the way, you know. And um, obviously being with Heidi made me think a bit more about other people and, and community and all those nice things. So um, Heidi passed away almost, well, two years ago, almost to the day, funnily enough. Um, and that left a big gap, obviously, in our organisation. And, and obviously made me think, you know, what am I doing with my life? You know, it's obviously not just about making money. There's got to be other things that are, that are going to keep us going here. So um, this idea of free movement basically comes from Heidi's very genuine uh, desire to help other people. You know, that, that's basically where it's coming from. <clears throat> so when I think about this... I think that this looks like the most outrageous little thing with free Moodle like sitting in the middle of all these amazing systems. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit arrogant to actually do that. But um, the idea is that free Moodle could be a learning destination for, for the world. Just like Flickr is a destination to share your photos or, or uh, you know, uh, Facebook is a destination to keep up to date with friends and what they do. Maybe there could be a destination that people go to to learn stuff. Yeah. Um, so who's it for? Well, it's for anyone that wants to learn. Uh, but it's not for private courses. You, know, you can't put a course on here that's private. All courses have to have guest access. You can, additionally, create an enrolment and give an enrolment key out. And by using things like groups and groupings, you could hide assessments and quizzes, for example, and assignments, so that only people you've given the key to will see those. But everyone else in the world will see all the information and all the resources that you've put together. Yeah? So you kind of have this multi-tiered approach. Um, so, yeah, it's not for commercial organisations, and it's not for teaching people how to use Moodle. You know, we get quite a few requests from teachers saying, I want to do a course on how to use Moodle. And I'm like, there's millions of them out there already. You know, we don't, it's not for that. Um, that's what the site looks like, roughly. Uh, it's a bit out of date. Um, we need to do some work on making that easier and perhaps more visually driven. We'll, we'll come to that later. Um, so the site is multilingual from day one. All, all languages that Moodle supports. Uh, we have support areas, um, and it is a standard Moodle environment. So the only thing that's been added at this stage are, are two modules. I'll talk about one in a minute. Uh, one of them is the certificate module, so that teachers can design a course, which then allows at the end people to print a certificate. That, that to me, seems just a, a... I mean, I think that should be a Moodle core. And I always have done, and I'm one of the people that argue for it. It's not there yet. Maybe one day it will be. To me, it seems just so important. Um, so the reason we keep it standard is that at any time, you as a teacher can back up your own course. Yeah? So you might be working in a university or a school, and, and you, you don't have the ability to back up your course. You know, it's been taken away for obvious reasons. Here, we, we need to keep it open. And we allow people, and we say, to them, you take a backup of your course any time you want, and if you want to take that course and things change and you need to run that in a private environment instead, you can do that. Yeah. We have lots of themes added in. Uh, they need revising from time to time, obviously, as the version of Moodle changes, but you, know, you can make your course look, look nice. And the structure of it actually mirrors... Mooch, or as it's known now, Moodle.net, from about uh, a month ago. Martin actually mentioned that in his keynote. So, um, Moodle.net, or Mooch, if you prefer the old, basically has all these categories of courses. And what we've done on Free Moodle is actually match those exactly. So, if you create a course on freemoodle.org on 
mechanical engineering, you're able to publish it as a link straight into Moodle.net in the same category. So it, it mirrors it. It seemed like a very logical thing to do. Uh, we have a site policy on the site, which obviously changes from time to time. And we have a course request form. And one of the, you know, one of the questions on the course request is, did you read the site policy? And uh, uh, honestly, it's surprising. About 30% of people say no. I don't think I, these days, I would sign up to any site without having a quick glance at the site policy. But I think because we live in that world where you install an application and there's like 50 pages to read of an end user agreement, you know, who reads all that? No one. We all click yes, right? So, uh, unfortunately. So the, uh, but the site policy is there and we often refer people back to it. And it changes over time as, as, uh, as things have happened. Um, as I mentioned, we have some areas set up. We have a, a teacher's community area with a number of uh, forums in different languages for people. We have an area, a, a topic in there on certificates. Because although the certificates plugin is there and people can use it, uh, obviously the majority of teachers haven't used that activity before. So we actually explain how to use the certificate module. And uh, there's also information on using groups and groupings. Because if you, if you put users into a group and that group is in a grouping, you can then hide information from everyone else and just people in that grouping will see it. And that's quite, you know, that's quite important because it, it can allow teachers to put a course here but keep their assessments just for their own students. Uh, we have a little student study club or learner club this is an area that we, that we need to improve. Um, but basically, it's, uh, you know, we can't assume that all the learners that come to this site have encountered e-learning before. You know, you know, why would we assume that? Um, so we have a little area that is kind of just some basics on study techniques online, how to, you know, how to approach an online course. Um, this was pulled together, I have to be honest, quite quickly from a variety of different resources. <coughs> I would really like someone to come to me and say, you know, I teach study skills or I teach online learning. Uh, can, I, can I improve that course for you? I go, yeah, absolutely. You know, get involved, let's do that. Um, we do have some things here on Free Moodle as well, which, which you probably have never come across on a Moodle site for, for good reason. Um, I think we can learn a lot of things from the Amazons and the TripAdvisors and the Facebooks of the world. Um, you sometimes see discussions on Moodle.org about, you know, is Moodle the new Facebook or how do I make Moodle work more like Facebook? And I'm kind of like, well, you shouldn't in a way because they're different tools. Um, but you can still learn certain things uh, from them. So we could have a simple liking system so that as, um, as people discover a course, maybe they really enjoyed it, they should be able to like it so that other people can say that. Or maybe we need to get a little bit more sophisticated. So you know like on Amazon where you've got a five star rating and you can just click a star and then obviously over time as more people you know, rate it, it becomes a more and more reliable community driven sort of quality uh, indicator. So we do have plugins available in Moodle. Uh, there's a plugin called Rate a Course. And this allows you to create a block with this simple uh, five star thing. And you can go in as a, as a student, give a rating, one to five, blah, blah, blah. There it is, done. And obviously, it'll aggregate those over time. As a teacher, you can actually go in there and see who rated the course high or low, or whatever, if you wanted to follow up on that, for example. Um, we also want to do things like, you know, encourage people to give lots of feedback. So comments, blocks, and forums. Uh, we can also use the sticky block system, which used to be really popular on 1.9. It's quite awkward to do in 2.0, but it is possible. So you can force a block to appear on every course. Right? So if this was a commercial, if this was a really, if this was a commercial entity, we'd have a block with a link to our services and websites and stuff and we'd force that into every course. Obviously we're not going to do that. But what we can do is we can force every course to have a rating system. So even if the teacher said, oh I don't really want that, 
we were like, well, this is a community site and we want to know, we want the community to rate it. Obviously, you'd never have that in your own school. Imagine if every student in your school or university could suddenly rate your courses and it was that visible to everyone. Right. Like rate Yeah. <laughs> um, the other system we've looked at, and we might actually go to this, is the course awards block, which is developed by... Um, by Jenny over there in the UK, um, Open University, but it's something she does in her spare time. But this is a more advanced system, so it allows you to vote for the course, but also put a comment. Um, and uh, the, the stars are different colours. Uh, there have been some discussions around that about accessibility standards, of course, because if you're colour blind, the orange and the green are probably the same and stuff. Um, but the system also allows automated course awards. So you can set a course and say, if this course achieves a, a rating of, of four from more than ten people, automatically give the course an award. Yeah, and stuff like that. You can manually award a course as well. So that's quite interesting, you know. Uh, not, not something can you, you... Can you do that for eight minutes? No. It's, it's, it's a course level. Yeah. Um, so at the moment on our front page, we've got a, a featured course block. And basically, it's something I guess you're all familiar with. You create a glossary, uh, you put it in a hidden section or you hide it, and then you add a random glossary block and it pulls an entry out and it obviously rotates each day or every time you visit the, the course. Um, but what I'm thinking is, rather than having just a random selection of, of these featured courses, uh, we can write a bit of code and actually have a block on the front which is showing the highest rated courses this month or the highest rated courses this today or whatever. And that would be quite an interesting little development. Um, once we'd set this up and started telling people about it, it, it became clear to us really quickly that we needed to be very, very smart on our reporting and monitoring. Um, Generally, when we're working with clients or, and, and people like yourselves, you know who your users are. You know who your teachers are, and you know you've got students. Okay? This is a totally open site, anyone in the world. So we had no, there's no data for who's going to register here or what they want to do or where they're from or what age they are or what their educational background is. Yeah? It's, it's completely open. And um, we realised that we needed to be able to report and understand the users because uh, it's so varied. So from the beginning uh, we had this as a multilingual environment. Now I have no problem, I have no problem with someone writing a course in French or Portuguese and um, running that course, you know, we can, we can tell whether it's you know, quite easily, whether it's an appropriate course and, or whether it's, you know, whatever, links to pornography sites, whatever, well, it's obvious. Um, However, what wasn't obvious to us, uh, you know in your courses you have an option to force the language, okay, in, in your course settings, okay, so this person comes in and they create their course in, let's say, Portuguese, okay, and they force the language to Portuguese, and they then do something and email the help desk and say, um, something's going on in my course, can you sort it out, okay, we log in, and the interface is in Portuguese, because the course is forced to Portuguese. Okay? Now, we, we're lucky. We have English and German and uh, Spanish and Greek, but we don't have Swahili or Portuguese on the staff. So, so it became quite a problem. And, and uh, we've actually taken that function off for a teacher to be able to force the language of a course. And uh, we have to think this through, actually, because that seems like quite a big change, you know, that a teacher can't force the language of a course. But of course, Moodle itself and browsers are, are so smart these days that Moodle will put the language of the course in the language of your operating system or browser or user profile anyway. There's absolutely no need for a teacher to force the language of a course. The only time I can see that would be a real need is if you're teaching languages, for example, and you want that environment set enforced in that language. Uh, but for general use, there's absolutely no need for it.
So um, we needed to explain to teachers that they didn't do that. And we actually just added a bit of code, so it it's basically freezes the language to not forced. So you can't force it. Um, so we launched this you know, roughly July 2011. And as we'd expect, as we'd hope, you know, the, the growth has been reasonably steady. Um, and I think some of these bumps are when, from our, when we've been presenting at Moodle notes around the world about this, you know. Uh, and it was very interesting in places like Greece and Spain to be talking about an educational system that they could use for free. Uh, there are a number of, of projects from Greece that are using this now to educate people in English or computer skills, you know because quite literally no one in Greece has the money to do this. Not the government or individuals or anyone right now. And a similar position in Spain, uh, frighteningly enough, you know, 25% unemployment. I mean, it's just, you know, it's not great times over there. So, so we, de we definitely get these jumps in interest as we've spoken around the world to people. Um, we can also, of course, look at the activity of individual courses and see what's, uh, what's popular. So, uh, we have things like IT concepts and high school chemistry and trigonometry and APA style and, you know, and then some, some Spanish ones in there. So we're able to see where users are actually going and where, where, you know, where, where the main activity is. <coughs> um, so we... But even that wasn't really enough for us. It doesn't really show us in enough detail what we need to know about the users. Um, so we have lots of optional or plug-in logs and reports. I'm just going to mention a couple of them because if this is of interest to you, this, we've been through this learning curve already. Um, um, you can just read about the Moodle logs and reports. They're quite well documented. Uh, there's a plug-in for SQL queries called Custom SQL Query Report which if you can write a bit of basic SQL, you know, select user ID from this table between these dates and show me their activity in this course, you know, that's a, a typical kind of... Uh, if you can do that, you can use that report. If, uh, if you have, if you want to do sort of access to the back end and a bit more and sort of PHP, you can use something like Adminer, which is actually, if you use PHP MyAdmin at the moment on your Moodle site, should really swap to adminer. Yeah. Um, and configurable reports, which is, which is the interesting one, or the easy one I'm going to look at in a second. This is developed by Juan over at the uh, Moodle partner in Spain, CVNA. And um, he's been working on this report system for uh, 18 months, two years now. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is so good. What, the work he's done on this is so good that this is going to make it into Moodle core at some point. Probably not in time for 2.5, but hopefully 2.6. Um, because what it enables you to do is just use a menu system and say, you know, on this drop down, do me a category report on this category and show me all the activity between these dates for this task. And it'll just pull that information out of the back end. Hugely powerful, but very easy to use. Um, it's so easy to use that we do things like this. We actually have courses that are. Uh, just links to queries. So, so we've got the queries in the background, and this is just a course that we can go into and say, okay, uh, ungraded assignments, bang, show me every ungraded assignment on the site right now. Uh, or um, show me uh, all the, uh, you know, the, the roles by teacher or by non assistant teacher. So by using these SQL techniques, we can write very... Uh, focused uh, reports and this is the configurable reports one where you can choose to do a, a category type uh, analysis or a course analysis or look at an individual user you know really quite powerful you can export them in excel format or even better open document format um, you know very cool so we have all these reports now written uh, we can go instantly let's view every user enrolled for more than four weeks or who hasn't, who hasn't logged in during the last 120 days. We can either view it, edit it if we want to say, well, oh, I need a month, not three months, uh, or just ODS and export it straight out. Yeah. Um, so the language distribution, 
And this, of course, is one of our challenges because we don't speak other languages. But basically, you know, 90, 90 plus courses in English, 40 plus in Spanish, quite a few in Greek, and then a smattering of Romanian and Polish and whatever. Okay. Um, th these figures are out of date now. We've, we've got, <coughs> we've actually got, uh, the last time I used this presentation was in Vancouver in February. Uh, we're now at almost 6,000 users. It's about five and a half. Okay. So some of the challenges that I think we have um, are obviously around uh, sustainability and, and long term. You know, I don't, I don't want this to be... Do you know what frustrates me a lot in New Zealand? Slight digression. Um, <laughs> the amount of funding from government that goes into projects that go nowhere. They, uh, but genuinely good ideas seem to have the right people in them, get funding, <coughs> produce something pretty interesting, and then it just fades out. And if you go and look at that website now, it's like, well, no one's done anything with it for five years. Well, where did that actually go? You know? uh, that, that frustrates me as a, as a businessman, as a taxpayer. As, you know, frustrates me. Um, but obviously funding is, is a huge challenge of, of any project. Um, so um, the organisation behind freemoodle.org, uh, we actually have a trust called the um, Heidi Milo Educational Foundation Trust. Okay. And we have four trustees. That's myself, Heidi's mum, Miriam, and Jane Shaw, who's also here somewhere in the conference. Um, the trust actually went through the process to get charitable status, and we got that earlier this year, which is really good, because um, it's kind of a recognition of the fact that all our documentation must be in place to show that what we're doing is, is not <coughs> what we saw earlier. It's not a lost leader to something else. This is very genuinely not-for-profit stuff. Um, and, of course, because we have charitable status, people in New Zealand can also make, obviously, donations of $5 that are tax-free. Uh, we still have to keep all our accounts but obviously we don't pay tax on uh, that and all the money goes back into funding other projects and, and you know longer term I'd like to see some of that funding going to particular teachers or particular groups of teachers to develop things um, right now uh, all the funding is obviously provided by HRDNZ sort of our commercial company uh, and we obviously had to do quite a lot of work with the Charities Commission to explain that, that these are two separate entities and one funds the other. Um, so we fund everything. But I mean, that's, to be honest, that's pretty easy for us. We've got servers for Africa, you know, we've got networks and, and processes and people and bandwidth allowing, you know, it's all there. Actually doing this isn't a major hit for us. We didn't actually need any extra equipment, you know. <laughs> it's like easy to do. Longer term we will. You know, uh, 5,000 users now, you know, three years' time, 50,000 users. You know, we need to obviously plan how we're going to uh, accommodate all this. And the servers, to be honest, I mean, right now they're in New Zealand. They will almost certainly move to America or maybe Germany later this year. And, and the simple reality is that the, the, the bandwidth and the capabilities and the connections in those countries are just way better than we have here. And if 90% if of our uh, users are all around the world, then you know we don't want them having to go through that bottleneck of getting to New Zealand. And it's quite sad that I have to say that. I'm sure Don would have wonderful opinions on <laughs> telecom and infrastructure and stuff. You know, reality is it's probably going to have to move to America. Um, we get interesting questions as well from people who, who start using it. And uh, you know, this, this is a, this an example one that came from a guy in uh, America, I think. You know. Well, obviously, America now read it. <laughs> all our, you know, he said all our students are subject to, uh, to, to privacy protection and US law and, and so on, you know. Um, can we use your site, given this? And um, obviously, we do have to take data protection and security, importantly. Um, ultimately, though, if this doesn't work for you because the, the legislative environment in which you're working, whether that's governmental or or institutional, if, if there's things there that mean you can't use this, then you can't use it. You know, I'm not forcing you to use it. As a teacher, you need to understand the implications and make that decision yourself. Yeah. 
Uh, but it's kind of interesting that when you do this, you know, suddenly a teacher in, in the UK or, or, or America could be running their course completely on here and theoretically outside of those jurisdictions and those controls. You know? um, so we need, or we, well, we need, we, we have been promoting this uh, project and uh, sharing it and explaining it to people. I think we're still very early, so, so our focus at the moment is still very much on teachers and, and educators, and that's why we've gone to something like 12 Moodle Moots in the last two years around the world to actually let people know. Because, to be honest, the, best, the two best places to let people know about this, if it's going to be successful, are Moodle Moots and Moodle.org. You know, they're the two places where you've got the people that are going to change it, you know, people, people that are going to contribute or make it happen. So. Um, yeah, uh, and the rest of you know, the rest of this year is very much about promoting it and um, moving to the second stage. I think the second stage, logically, is, is going to start kicking in next year when we think, okay, how do we reach just people that want to learn? You know, because I see this as being something that uh, you know, you might be a, a kid growing up in Liverpool or, or or Manchester or London, right? Your parents don't really care about your education, maybe. Certainly, a lot of your peer group don't. Your access to materials and access to facilities probably isn't that great. So, so that kid, instead of instead of just playing Doom or, or Final Fantasy or whatever it is they're doing, at home, you know, some of those kids will actually be like we were when we were young, wondering why the sky's blue, you know, why why it rains here, why it, you know, if we can. Pre- if we can just get people and provide people with resources to learn from, just for the joy and interest of learning, that's great. Um, so we uh, do promote it a little bit, and um, that gives a, a breakdown of where people are, are, are finding out about free Moodle. We um, just a simple choice on the or feedback activity rather on the site. Um, as we'd expect, you know, quite a few coming through from Moodle.org and forums and so on. A general Google search, that's really good. Obviously, we've got our search engine optimization right there to be getting 33% or so. And uh, I've had a couple of people actually last month contact me and said, we did a search for free Moodle and you came up first, right, every time. Like, how do you do this? Can you tell us how to get our site? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm like thinking, okay, so do I just flick that email to myself at HRD and say... You know, I'm going to answer you from a commercial point of view and, and say, do you, want, do you want to be billed for this? Because you know, we can do that, but whether we start doing that for free for people is <laughs> a different question. Um, we do reject courses. So we have a simple course request form. You just fill in the course request, say what your subject is, where you're from, etc. And uh, at the moment, we are rejecting between 20 and 30% of course requests as soon as we get them which wasn't something that I'd ever envisaged. It seems like a bit of a waste of time in some ways. Um, and the main reason we request them are, are these. Firstly, because they want to create a training course about Moodle. Yeah. And I understand that because this is generally, I think, people who've discovered Moodle.org, they're fairly new to Moodle, they've got a little company or some colleagues they want to show, and they, they get to this link, oh, it's free Moodle hosting, they don't bother to read the site policy, and they ask for a course. You, know, you can see how it works. Um, but I'm resisting that, because there are plenty of courses on how to use Moodle out there. Paid, free, YouTube, whatever. You know, there's a whole raft, you don't need to do that. Um, we also have a percentage of teachers that just want to experiment, just want to learn Moodle by using free Moodle. And I get that, but I think our focus has to be very very clearly on the learners or the potential learners, not on the staff development needs. So um, we direct people to demo.moodle.net where you can go and create a login and experiment to your wildest dreams and it just gets reset every hour. You can do anything you want there. You don't need to do that on free moon. Um, teachers who want a course just for their own class, you know, we're not in that business. We don't want Mr. Smith running his chemistry course on here just for his students. He's willing to share that with others, fantastic, but this is not the place for your own private course. 
Um, and sometimes we just get you know, requests with no description, no, and I'm like, no, you know, just delete it. Seriously, if it's that good and it's that important, they're going to ask again. But if you can't be bothered to fill in a simple, you know, eight, eight field form, then no, you're probably not the type of person that's going to contribute really well, to be honest. Um, and we do get a number of um, students as well, like people that are doing teacher training, and their teacher's gone, right, okay, uh, week three, you need to go off and make your own Moodle course, um, and here's a place you can go and do it. You know, and that, that's just, there's no real value for, uh, for people. Uh, okay, so things we need to do in the future, improve this study club. I mean, really, create something that really helps these first-time learners or people that haven't experienced Moodle or, or e-learning or online learning before. Something that really works well. I'm not sure what it is. Kind of in my mind, I know, I think, I think when I see it, I'll, I'll go, yeah, I understand that now. Um, but I need someone more, uh, more skilled in that area than, than I am. Um, obviously improving the teacher in the community area as well. I think we need more guidance for best practice course design. I mean, I'll be honest, you can, you can go and look at, what, 140 courses here that are created and free and open. And just like your own school or your own university or your own company, some of them are very good and some of them are not so good. Yeah. I think that one of the roles for, for our team, if you like, is to have time and resource to be able to just go in there and go, hi, we were just looking at your course on... a on animal husbandry. Where did that from? <laughs> um, I, I really shouldn't do this. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we've got some time. Would you like some help on your quiz? Because it doesn't seem, you know, like you quite understand what's going on. Or would you like some help on your graphics? Or, you know, and actually help people produce better courses. I think that's going to be one of our focuses. Uh, I want to make the site more visually driven. It's definitely too text heavy at the moment, which obviously... Uh, creates, creates barriers for different languages. Um, there's an ongoing, I guess, within Moodle, you know, how do you make it more accessible, how do you make it more usable. There's lots of stuff out on the web that we can integrate, and obviously Moodle itself is getting better and better at that. Uh, relocate servers to US and Europe, as I said. Um, secure funding. Um, one of the things I didn't say is obviously as a registered charity we're now able to apply to, to certain funds for you know a little bit of funding to help out so we'll probably start doing that. Um, lots of courses available there. It's been quite fascinating seeing what teachers come up with. Um, uh, the bio me course is quite interesting that's um, developed by a lady over in America. Um, 101 Nights a Great Film. I really like that one. Actually, if you like movies, that goes from like you know Charlie Chaplin through film noir and the 70s. That's a really cool little course if you like films. Um, the American Identity, all about politics and where Americans feel they fit in the world today. That's cool. Uh, machine learning. Uh, that's a nice one because it's from someone in New Zealand. Uh, all about sort of artificial intelligence and, and that stuff. Um, and I mean, that, that shows, you know, the diversity. I mean, I can't think of a subject that you couldn't have on there, really. Um, you know, anything that's cool. So, um, this year we're also going to do a few more fun things with it. We're going to have a best course design competition. Um, try and get people, you know, try and get the, the community there using better design and, and, and uh, employing good best practice and so on. Um, we also want to get people doing more group work. So, you know, I think it's, it's things that have been alluded to by some of the keynotes as well. You know, why have 16 teachers around New Zealand all developing their own course in uh, physics in 16 schools, you know? Why not collaborate on that in some way, reduce your work? Um, and each of those teachers obviously has different skills and different knowledge. Maybe one's great at graphics, another one's great at quizzes and lessons, you know? Put those together, the actual outcome product is way better than any of those individual courses, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I also want to get some more international collaboration happening. Um, we actually have at the moment some Canadian teachers working with some teachers from, I can't remember where it is, uh, and they're starting to go through that process of, okay, so we've got different curriculums, 
and we've got different unit standards, we've got different performance criteria, but we can still write course content that fulfills those things. You know? So there's some interesting challenges around that. And I also want to do just what I, what I called Inspire Awards. So, as, you know, again, thinking about the things that, as, as, a, as a kid, that really used to interest me, you know, it was things like music and, and dinosaurs and going into space, you know. I'd like to see some courses that are, that are really just totally engaging in really interesting areas. So, um, anyway. Uh, so, if you're interested in uh, helping in any way, um, the, the, the most, the, the best thing you can do for us is really just let other people know about this through, through your tweets and your Facebooks and, and, and your social networks and so on. You know, just let other people know about it. Um, the less we have to spend on marketing this, the better. Because to me, that's wasted money. I mean, I think that's wasted money from a commercial perspective. I certainly think it's wasted money from a, 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 you know, a charitable perspective. So minimise that as much as possible. Um, consider creating a course if there's something you're passionate about. Uh, obviously, all incredibly busy people, but sometimes you might think, oh, yeah, actually, I could do that in, in this context. I don't necessarily have to do that on, on my work site, for example. Um, or find a course that's in there that's similar to something that you teach and, and contact the teacher and say, hey, do you want to work together on this? Um, and then we also, as things get busier, we realise that we're going to need uh, coordinators for different categories of languages. So obviously in the science category, you know, there's biology and chemistry and physics and whatever. Um, I'm not an expert in those areas. But if we had one person who was you know, very knowledgeable on science, could just keep an eye on that category and what's happening in there, what those teachers are doing, you know. So I think we'll, we'll naturally get people focusing on certain sections and, and trying to support that. Okay. I've put, um, let's have a quick look at the site, but we um, probably won't because we've only got 20, uh, 10 minutes left. Um, but yeah, you can get to the site yourself. Uh, as I said, it looks a little bit different from those earlier screenshots. Uh, we've got a nice little statistics thing there. It's just shown how many people are logging in and, and kind of what they're doing. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges that I'm thinking about at the moment is how do you enable people to find courses easily? Uh, yeah, we, I mean, we've got, in Moodle, of course, we've got the, you know, we can navigate around and go to the English category and blah, blah, blah. Um, and we've also just done, at this stage, simple things like giving people a, a link to the, um, straight to the search page. So if I, if I did that, and then I could just type in, I'll oh, show me things on biology. You know, it should pull back any courses that are, you know, biology in the name, um, simple stuff like that. Um, I th I th I'd like to be a bit more sophisticated in, in the way we get to courses. If you look at other systems like Coursera and some of the other LMSs and websites, just getting to things is a hell of a lot easier than it is in Moodle. You know, uh, now Moodle itself will develop, but. Um, there are certainly, yeah. yeah, something I'd like. I'd like to do more there. <coughs> um, you know, we have a news group. This is the featured course glossary at the moment, which is just pulling a little glossary entry. But uh, as I said, I think eventually that should be replaced by a top ten courses or popular courses kind of block that's driven by the community. It's certainly not our job to rate courses. Yeah, that's where we have to learn from the wider internet trends and so on. So feel free to go in there, have a look, um, and obviously I would be always interested in any, in any comments or feedback that, that you give, um, and um, that sort of finishes it, so I'm quite happy to take questions for five minutes. I was going to say, Stuart, how do you donate? But there's a little donate. There is a little donate. There's some way you can support the submission. Any other questions? Um, okay, no you can't, I mean you can contact us but we'd say no. Um, you can't because, because the, the force language setting has to be disabled at a site level, okay, and that's what we've done, okay. However, remember that if you want 
your language forced or you want your users to have their language forced, go to your own profile, change it on your profile. Because if your, your language on your profile page will always override a kind of non-setting a category or course or site level. Yeah. No, um, that's one of the key differences between what used to be called Mooch, is now called Moodle.net, and Free Moodle. Okay, Mooch, I'm still calling it Mooch, Moodle.net. Um, that enables you to publish either a link to a course which is enrollable yeah. on a different Moodle site, or to upload a zip file that other people can download and install on their own Moodle site. Uh, they're both useful, but I mean, how many people can actually download a zip file of a Moodle course and install it on their Moodle site? Only administrators. Yeah. This, so Free Moodle is different in that, as a teacher, you are able to create your course, back it up at any time, and of course any other teacher could, could do the same thing. So if, if you say to us, oh, we've got another teacher in here, or, you know, that teacher is also able to, to back that up. Okay, so I have a course on that, which was created in Commons, which I think you took from Roach. Right. You wrote to me, so Okay. Was um, that Paula? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, would it, it be acceptable for me to go on that course and if you want a copy of this? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, and, you know, people have asked similar questions about, they might say, okay, we run lots of courses in, let's say, Microsoft Office, right? Can we put a free course on freemoodle.org with a link to our paid courses? Right. Um, and my response to that has been, yes, you can, as long as that free course represents something that's truly valuable and useful yeah because then it's people's choice whether they follow your link or buy your services right but yeah don't do three paragraphs and one quiz right and use it just as a just as a funnel yeah yeah if it's genuinely useful and yeah absolutely why not i mean you've got to be realistic sure and on that point i think we'll draw the session to a close thank you very much Stuart. Another lovely bottle of